Good morning, brothers and sisters. Good to see you all this morning. Thanks for having me back. Uh, my name's Steve. Uh, Gary's invited me, so uh, I come back and worship a couple times this summer. So uh, all complaints can go this way. Uh, but uh, looking at the, the sermon title, Pastor Gary's sermon this morning, When Life Gets Hard. Um, I don't know about you, but for me, when life gets hard, two things I need to know about God. He's in control. And He's good. He's good. Uh, and so that's a lot of where uh, my heart was in preparing songs for this morning. It was just to, to get me to remember, to get my heart to remember, God is in control. It's good. So, this is a song that we, we did last week here, so if you were around last week, hopefully it sounds a little bit familiar at least. Uh, if not, it's uh, pretty easy to catch on to. Thank you. 
Jesus, thank you. We greet you this morning together and acknowledge that we live for you and that you are worthy of all our praise. Would you be with us as we gather this morning? We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Would you stand and greet one another? Yes. standing, if you will. I was sharing earlier this morning, uh, there's a word that comes up in the next two songs, and uh, it's one of my favorite words uh, when it comes to worship. Uh, it's just the word rescue. Just the word rescue. And I don't know how many of you have felt that God has rescued you, but I've, I've certainly been in those times where there was no way out. And I felt God reach in and, and grab me and rescue me. So, um. Jesus, Messiah. 
Tune our hearts to, to your grace, to your love, to you. Believe the truth of who you are and the truth of your love for us. song for now is a um, very old song, written back in the 1800s, and uh, I believe this might be a, a slightly different tune uh, than what some of you might be used to, uh, so, uh, but the, the lyrics, um, just so rich, so rich, uh, and when Pastor Gary shared that uh, he was talking about life getting hard, and thinking about God being good and God being in control. Uh, I can't tell you the number of times the last year uh, that I've come back to this song. Uh, it just was introduced to me just a year ago. So. Jesus, I rest in rest in you. 
This morning's scripture reading comes from Philippians. I'll be reading chapter 1, verses 12 to 23. Paul's chains advance the gospel. 
Now I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Because of my chains, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so in love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help given by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is He. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet, what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. start here. Uh, it's great to see Mike. You're a man of your word. Right? He said whenever I'm up here, he's going to be here. He's one of my biggest cheerleaders in the back there. Great to see you, Mike. And uh, this is what makes youth ministry so great as you see these students come back. Do many of you remember Ryan Spangler? He is with us today. And his friend, Anna Marie? Anne Marie. So, and, and they met at Spruce Lake. Right? You met as they were both working up at Spruce Lake. So it's great to see uh, Ryan and Anne Marie and to have you with us. It's great to be back. You know, last week was uh, when you, um, this is more on a lighter note, note uh, when I, start, I started working on the sermon, well, I pretty much finished it before I went on our mission trip. And Mission trips are getting harder and harder and harder for me. They, I mean, I, you know, in a month from now, I'm going to have such great memories of this mission trip. And I won't forget about the first day that we went. And uh, we're just about ready to get on the turnpike up in uh, Quaker Town just to go up to Route 78. And I realized I forgot my insulin. So I had to turn back, run on. It was in my car here. It turned along with our pillows that we forgot, but we didn't take them with us. And it just got us off to a hard, rough start. We're an hour behind now. And uh, we're, the, the trip down was pretty good until we hit Route 64, right off of 81. And there was a, a rainstorm like I'd never seen. We were going down this main highway at 20 miles an hour with our flashers on. And uh, finally got out of that. Then we get to the camp which is at Liberty University. If you know anything about Liberty University, it's huge. It's a couple miles, yeah, it's, it's bigger than huge. It's just, and we had no idea where to go, right? We didn't know, and so we pull in and we're like, whoa, the football stadium's here, and all kinds of stuff, and, and we're just looking around. Well, they had to send out an APB an all-point bulletin to find a green van from uh, Pennsylvania that was totally lost. We had no idea. Life was hard. That first day, finally, they came out and got us in. Right when you come in the main entrance, there was a little red sign that said, Fuge Camps, that way. We're looking up here. <laughs> we didn't even see the sign. So we finally got to where we had to go. Other than work, walking, what, four or five miles a day to everything? It was good. It was good. Life gets hard. And thank you for sharing that song, uh, Steve. I, it's a really neat song. I'm just 
disappointed we didn't have the words there the whole time, but thank you for sharing that song, because when life gets hard, I think we all need places to go. Other than, I have a couple favorite uh, passages, chapters in the Bible. Philippians, I've preached in Philippians before, but it's one of my favorite. Um, but this whole thing, when life gets hard, Life is hard for me right now. I'm going to uh, be honest. I'm not going to get into the details. But there's a lot of things that are going on in my life that I'm struggling with. I'm struggling big time with. So as I'm <laughs> trying to get this message together, I, I just realized that Philippians, which is Paul's joy letter, you know, that's where Paul, uh, you know what, if, if life is hard for you, how, let, let me start here, I'm kind of rambling here and I apologize for that, but how many people have gone through hard times of life here? I think if we're honest, most of us have. Life, God never promised that life was going to be easy. He promised he'd be with us through all the times, but he never promised life would be easy. So, this sermon, I'm speaking to myself. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, it, it, this sermon is just something that, I don't want to sound like old, but it has kept me up at night with some of these things that are going on in my life. I know Lowell was always, I don't think he ever slept, though. That's the thing about Pastor Lowell, so... There was a story. This guy told this story. One day, he got into a taxi cab and took off for the airport. And they were driving in the right lane when a car suddenly sped out of an alley right in front of them. He said, my taxi dock driver slammed on the brake, skidded, and missed crashing into the other car by inches. The driver of that car stuck his head out the window and yelled at us. My taxi driver just smiled and waved at him. So I asked the taxi driver, why did you just smile at him? That guy almost caused a wreck and then began cursing you out. That's when my taxi cab driver taught me what I call now the lesson of the garbage truck. He explained that many people are like garbage trucks. They run around full of garbage, full of stuff, full of frustration, full of anger, full of disappointment. And as their garbage piles up, eventually you're going to need a place to dump it. And sometimes they'll dump it on you. Don't take it, the taxi driver said, don't take it personally. Don't take their garbage and dump it on other people at home or at work or on the streets, whoever you meet. Just smile and wish them well and move on. You see, what you pay attention to, what you dwell on in life will generally, deter will generally determine what kind of decisions you make. Ella Wilcock wrote, one ship sails east and another west, with the same wind that blows. It's how you set the sails, not the gale of the wind which determines which way you go. The Apostle Paul in, uh, gave us a great advice in Philippians 4, verse 8. And we all know this. It's one that I think we should memorize when we are going through these hard times in life. And I'll be very honest, I fail at this. Quite often. Uh, uh, it says here, Paul writes this, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is ex excellent or praiseworthy, think on these things. When life is hard for, for you, do you think of those things? I struggle with that. Look at everything that we're bombarded with in life. 
Think about what you hear on TV. Think about what you can read on, on the Internet. Uh, this past week we talked a lot about technology and, and how destructive that can be. Why is it that the news media is always um, talking about bad news? It's because bad news sells. Good news doesn't sell. Although I get a little verklempt when I read a story about a dog that was rescued and, uh, and uh, he got a great life now. You know, I, I get a little teary when I'm sitting in my office reading those things. But bad news sells, so we're constantly being bombarded with negative things. But I want to break, I want to help us break that pattern this morning by looking at what Paul says. What Shannon read from Paul, and you've got to understand, Paul's in prison now. Paul's, <laughs> Paul's life, his life was harder than we could ever imagine, right? So I want to look at, at uh, three things this, this morning of how we can battle when life gets hard. First of all, we're going to, Paul says, we're going to face unpleasant circumstances. And Paul talks about that in verse 12. And it says, now I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really, has really served to advance the gospel. Paul writes that. Why well, he's chained to a prison guard. And worse yet, he was falsely accused. You think we have troubles? Look at Paul's trouble. We don't have troubles. How does your list compare to, to, to Paul's list? How many times have you been shipwrecked? How many times have you been beaten? to near death. This is convicting stuff, at least it is for me. How many times have you been arrested, chained up, and imprisoned for 24 hours a day? Yet, you know what Paul says? I remember all these trials, and I see that they have all served to advance the gospel. Wow. When I'm going through a hard time, when I'm going through uh, some of the things that I'm going through, am I advancing the gospel? That's what Paul says we should do. Paul saying, all these things have happened to me, have resulted in clearing the way so that the gospel might be preached more effectively. In verse 13, he says, as a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Now, here's the situation. Paul's chained to a prison guard 24 hours a day. And every six hours, there's a different guard that comes in and gets chained up to him. The soldiers doing their duty, right? They're doing what they're told, making sure that the prisoner, Paul, wouldn't escape. But you know what Paul does? He looks at this as a wonderful opportunity to spread the gospel to these prison soldiers. They're captive audience. They can't go anywhere. They've got to stay there, and Paul can tell them all the good news. And in the... Uh, Fourth, like I mentioned in the uh, chapter 4 of, uh, and verse 22 of Philippians, it shows it there, it shows it there, um, that all the saints send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. Who are those people? They were the guards. They were converted. Well, Paul is in chains, and his life is terribly hard, at least from my small mind, his life is terribly hard. He is out there spreading the gospel. That's not easy to do. Paul said, because of my hardships, because of the things that have happened to me, other Christians have been encouraged. When you're going through hard times, do they look at your life and they're encouraged by what they see? They have now seen how God has encouraged and protected Paul through these difficult situations. 
And that should give us power and strength to get through our situations. Paul is convinced no matter what situation we're in, God is in control and He's going to take care of you. That is one thing that I got to keep telling myself. Uh, author Bob Benson wrote this in his book, a book called See You at the House. And it tells of a good friend who had a severe heart attack and almost died. But he was well on the road to recovery. While visiting him, Bob asked, Bill, how do you feel about your heart attack? Bill answered, I hate it. It nearly killed me. Bob asked him, maybe a foolish question, would you like to have another one? Bill said, certainly not. Uh, would you recommend it to anyone else? Bill said, absolutely not. Bob went on. Bill, now that you're feeling better, do you treasure your life more than before? Bill said, well, yeah, I guess I do. And then Bob asked him, what about your relationship with God? Has that changed since your heart attack? Bill said, yeah, I feel a whole lot closer to God now more than I ever did. Bill said, in the light of all this, how do you feel about your heart attack now? You see, God can take the most negative things that happen to us here on earth. They can, when you think you're at the lowest point, when life is so hard that you can hardly get up in the morning, God can make something great out of that. And that's something... We need to remember when we're going through it, and life, and life, and life gets hard. I just got a text. I don't know who texted me, but somebody just texted me. Um, when life gets hard, see now life is hard because I'm distracted. Um, when 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 life gets hard, we need to turn to our heavenly Father because he's he's waiting for us. He wants there. He wants to help us. He really wants to help because he loves us. We're his children. So much we can learn from the Apostle Paul. So, what has you changed? What chains are keeping you down today? Are you changed to lonely? Chained to loneliness? Grief? Despair? Are you changed? Are you chained to? Not having the perfect body? How do you really feel this morning? Are you chained to health issues, declining health? I'd like to just ask you, how do you feel this morning? And you know what? God can break those chains. God can take those chains and break everyone, no matter how low, no matter where you're at. God can break those chains. It's a promise we have in his word. And Paul is just telling us that. Um, it is what we can learn from the Apostle Paul is so amazing. The time has come that we break these chains. It might take some time. God works in his own timing. As long as you're looking to God and, and wanting him to help you. Um, he can break those chains that are holding you down. Unple We're going to face unpleasant circumstances. Second thing that Paul uh, says here, that we're going to face unreasonable people. None of us know any people that are unreasonable, right? We don't, we don't know anybody like that. I'm afraid some people say I'm unreasonable. Is that right, Brian? Am I unreasonable sometimes? No, good, good. That's good to hear. Paul talks about this in verse 15. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. And what Paul is saying here is that there are some people who are jealous of Paul. He, they're, they're jealous of him. And um, 
they see themselves as rivals, competitors in preaching the gospel. Now what happens when people become jealous of other people? Well, they try to tear them down. They try to make them look good. You, you, or try to make them look bad. They put out all the negatives that they can about that person. Happened to Billy Graham. Billy Graham. You know, he was one of the most godly people and the media, everybody was trying to find something. You know how it is today. Media likes to dig up things on whoever and they want to find out the dirt that they could find. So he goes often out on, a, on the trips his, uh, his, when he would go out and preach, his crusade, crusades, and a tabloid said, we got him. We got him. Because on the hotel that they were staying, actually Billy Graham would send people to the hotel to make sure there's no women there that are, you know, just so there's no appearance of things bad. So, um, a tabloid wrote, Billy Graham has spent the night with Beverly Shad. And uh, they said, we got him, man, it's, it's a... He's, he's not with his wife. We got him. Well, all you people know who George Beverly Shea is, one of Billy Graham's best friends. He was his soloist and singer. They were proven wrong. But the point is, everybody's out trying to make people look bad. We're going to face people like that in life. They're going to, they're going to talk down about you. There's going to be times when people gossip or say bad things about you. How are you going to react about that? Think about Paul. <laughs> Paul was in jail and he didn't even deserve it. He was, he was going through all this stuff and he didn't do anything wrong. But he's still there praising God. Spreading the word of God. Spreading the gospel to those who need. Writing these words so we have them, that we can fall back on them. So when somebody talks bad about you, or puts you down, or, or accuses you of something, are you going to react like Paul does? Or are we just going to go back to our sinful nature and start spreading hurtful and false things about the other people? When life gets hard. The third thing is an uncertain, Paul talks about an uncertain future. In verse 19 he says, I know that through your prayers and the help given by the, Holy, by, by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. Paul's facing trial in Rome. If he's found innocent... The good news is he's free to go preach some more, right? He's free to go out and keep preaching. If he's found guilty, he'll be executed. An uncertain future. He knew, he knew that either way he was going to live. Or he was going to die. But... Well, that depends on the result of the trials. But what did he say? Look at verse 20. Uh, he has two choices here to face. And one is he can keep preaching. The other, if he dies, he gets to go spend eternity with his glorious father. Uh, you know, to him, what's the best choice? Look at verse 20. He, he writes this. I eagerly expect and hope. That I will no way, uh, that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage, so that now, as always, Christ—this was his biggest thing—Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. You hear what he's saying here? 
He said that my concern is that when I stand before a pagan judge in a pagan court, that I won't do anything to embarrass Jesus, his Lord and Savior. I pray, he, when he was praying that he had enough courage to stand up in the midst of these pagans and still proclaim Christ. And by what he says and what he does, Christ will be exalted. And he's going on to say, whether I live or die, it doesn't matter. All I want to do is exalt Jesus. Verse 21, familiar verse. Another one that we should memorize. And many, many of us do know this one by heart. And in verse 21 it says, For me, for to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Or as the Living Bible paraphrases it this way, To me, living means opportunity for Christ. And dying, well that's even better. That's even better. One of the questions that we talked about, this is a little slide, uh, in our groups this week, we talked about death, dying, this past week. And it always, maybe it's my age, but whenever I ask the kids, and this happened for years and years, when I ask them, are you afraid of death? Are you afraid of dying? Every one of these young people, and they said it again, no, no, they're not. And I said, well, that's because you're 16, not 61, you know, and you're getting closer there. But these, the, the youth that I've worked with through the years encouraged me and said, Gary, what, what's, I'm teaching them this, that this is, the, the, this is what we all desire, this is what's going to happen. But I, I sometimes say, man, I'm afraid. I'll admit it. I'm afraid to die. Maybe I'm more afraid of how I'm going to die than, than, than actually dying. But Paul says here, he can't lose. He can't lose. Either way, he's going to win. If he stays alive, he can keep on preaching the gospel. If he dies, he has eternal life. I think that's something that we all need to, to uh, uh, remember. In verses 22 and 23, Paul says, if I'm going, if I am going let me start over here. If I am going, if I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor to me. Yet what shall I choose? I don't know. He doesn't know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is by far better. By far. Going to be with Jesus Christ is better. When life gets hard, sometimes when you, there's a lot of sadness when you lose a loved one. And one of the great things about being a, a Christian, and you know that the person that has, has, that has died, and they're a great Christian, one of the great hope, one of the great things that we as Christians get to hold on to, that we're going to be reunited with all those that have gone before us. So when life gets hard, we have two choices. We need to just grasp on to Jesus and the gospel more at that time. There's stories. There's stories of people uh, on, their, on their deathbed and uh, they're in pain and they're suffering. But all of a sudden, you're with the one who is a saint. And all of a sudden, the pain seems to disappear. They get a smile on their face. And they're ready to go. You've heard those stories over and over. And I believe that they're true. I was talking to a guy up at Landis's yesterday. And I was told him what I was preaching. And he said he just got a book. He just bought a book for like $2.99. Uh, James and Ollie's army person. So if you ever want to get some good books, Ollie's is the place to go. But it was about a guy who who was dead for 90 minutes. He was dead for 90 minutes, and he saw 
He saw the light and he said the thing that he saw the most was all the people that he knew coming to greet him. That gives me chills. I'd love to see my Grammy Castle run toward me when she couldn't run when she was here on earth. But, but the point is, we have that hope. And that's what Paul's saying here, that it's far better to go and be with Christ. Oh, it's great to be here, and we're going to miss our loved ones, and it's a sad time for us, but there's great hope there. So, uncertain futures. Story of one boy, or his dad was going to take him fishing. The little boy was eight years old, and his name was Frank. And they were going to go fishing on Saturday. They were going to fish the whole day, and he was going to spend time with his dad. On Friday night, some of us that go golfing, we can apply this to golf too. Uh, Friday night, they had everything laid out, and he was ready to go. But Saturday morning, when he awoke, he discovered it was raining cats and dogs. And they couldn't go fishing. So eight-year-old Frank grumbled and griped all day long. He kicked the furniture, even kicked the dog. Nothing was right. Why does it have to rain today? His father, his father tried to explain to him that the farmers needed rain. But that didn't satisfy you, Frank. Why did it have to rain today? About noon, the clouds broke and the sun came out. His dad said, well, we can't go fishing all day, but at least we can fish this afternoon. And they did, and they caught more fish than they ever did. Their basket was full of fish, and they had a wonderful time together. When they came home, Mom cooked some of the fish for supper. As they sat down to eat, Frank's dad looked at him and asked, Would you like to say the blessing, Frank? Eight-year-old Frank prayed this prayer. God, if I sounded a little grumpy earlier today, it was because I couldn't see far enough ahead. When life gets hard, when circumstances aren't going, quote, your way. Can we look past that? Can we look far enough ahead to say, God, you're in control. You take this. We need to take time to look and listen. We need to focus on more of the positive things. Because in Christ Jesus, we have a wonderful future. It may seem uncertain now. Things may be tough right now. Are we going to look past these hard times? But one day, one day, we'll see him face to face. And these hard times and these troubles won't be anymore. So when life gets hard, when life is uncertain, we need to remember the words of Paul and look forward to a greater future. This is something that, again, I am struggling with right now. And... I need to rely on Jesus Christ right now. Because with Him, everything's going to be great. It's going to be better than great. We, we can learn so much from this passage here from Paul. In this world of uncertainty, we have the great hope of something great. We need to look ahead to what our Lord Jesus Christ has for us. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth that is spoken through your word and through the Apostle Paul, Lord. Life is hard. Life is, is complicated sometimes. Sometimes we don't know 
what to do if it's right or wrong. But Lord, we need to keep our focus on you. Because through you, nothing but the best. All things are possible. And we know that there is a brighter day ahead for us. Again, Lord, we thank you for your word and we thank you for the teaching. We pray this in your name. Amen. to Steve uh, for the meaningful musical worship and <clears throat> Gary for that uh, strong reminder from the Apostle Paul to look far enough ahead. And uh, most of all, thank you uh, to the trustees for that 68 degree thermostat setting. Uh, that's a good number right there. Just a few reminders about our congregational uh, life here uh, this week. Uh, today is the uh, bring your own basket uh, picnic in the pavilion if you're willing to brave the heat. Uh, we'll be enjoying lunch there at 11 o'clock this morning. And if you forgot to bring something to eat, remember Royal Farms is just down the, uh, down the pike. Um, Kit will also have the quilt that uh, she had, uh, uh, along with others, uh, constructed for uh, Pastor Lowell and Brenda at their retirement uh, here uh, on view uh, over the uh, benches in the auditorium here after the worship service. For those of you who have not yet uh, had a chance to get a close-up look at that, uh, at the beautiful work there, so feel free to stop in and look at that in detail. Next week, um, our church family will be at Camp Menoland for the day. Uh, worship begins at 9.30 in the morning, 
following lunch. The afternoon will be filled with outdoor activities, <clears throat> including swimming to cool off. Uh, directions to Camp Meadowland are on the welcome table in the fellowship hall. Reminder that there will be no worship service here next week. Everything will be at Camp Meadowland, so we'll be uh, looking forward to seeing you all there. In your mailboxes this morning is an updated uh, Line Lexington Mennonite Church leadership sheet uh, distributed in the mailboxes this morning. Revised copies are issued uh, twice a year for your convenience so you know who to contact for various issues. Uh, extra copies are on the welcome table, so you, uh, we ask you to look over that leadership sheet. I'd like to make also a, 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 an update about the pastoral transition uh, on behalf of the pastoral search committee. Um, there's been a significant amount of behind-the-scenes behind the work going on during these summer months, even though you may not have heard many details. Uh, just a brief update. Uh, as previously recorded, uh, you know there is a very strong candidate uh, for senior pastor uh, that we have, and the pastoral search committee uh, and elders have been working with. And the Pastoral Search Committee has really been ready for quite some time now to introduce this candidate uh, to the congregation uh, for the senior pastor position. Uh, the holdup, or I guess it's not really a holdup, it's just that what has to be completed first is a, a full ministry leadership inquiry uh, process. Uh, the background checks, the uh, reference checks, uh, uh, with the help of our consultant, have all been long done. But the ministry leadership uh, inquiry process through Franconia Conference and Mennonite Church USA, as our new pastor will be uh, credentialed through Franconia Conference, uh, it is a lengthy process. Uh, it's administered by Mennonite Church USA and Franconia Mennonite Conference, and it's involving extensive communication uh, uh, with the candidate about his theological views, um, personality profiling, uh, psychological evaluation. So it's very thorough, but it is time consuming. Um, it's important though. Um, uh, it's important that we are part of a larger group, uh, uh, the Franconia Mennonite Conference, um, and it's important as our new pastor will be uh, part of that group, uh, that uh, he know them and they know him. Uh, so it's a very important process. Uh, but uh, uh, it's uh, the most likely scenario now is that uh, the a candidate would be introduced to the congregation sometime in late August um, with visits and sermon uh, from the candidate on two separate uh, uh, weekends. So uh, everyone, of course, is anxious to see the process uh, move ahead, uh, no one more than leadership and pastoral search committee. And it can be frustrating when it seems like the wheels grind so slowly, uh, but all in God's timing. Uh, and we want to thank especially uh, Derek and, and Matt as head of the heads of the pastoral search committee, Galen as chairman of elders, our uh, pastoral leadership uh, lead uh, minister, Noel Santiago, and Randy Haycock, our pastoral uh, lead advisor, for shepherding that process. They've been doing a, a ton of work backed up by the pastoral search committee uh, and the elders. So thank you to those who are moving that forward, even though we don't always see that week to week here. And uh, hopefully in August, we'll have more for you. All right. Um, a few prayer requests uh, to go over before uh, we join together in prayer. Uh, we're glad to see Mike uh, and Dorothy here today. Mike Hudak, uh, pleased that you've come through some medical testing and, and uh, gotten, uh, if I understand from her, uh, some better than anticipated results. And, and uh, we uh, ask for Mike continued uh, move toward uh, health. Carl Bauman, as you know, had been announced to had uh, some findings, but the good news for Carl is that there was no cancer found in the abdomen. He is having some uh, medical issues that can be dealt with, so we're very pleased to hear uh, good news for Carl Bauman. I spoke to Dick uh, uh, and Donna this morning. Uh, Gary had let me know that Dick's niece, Vicki Donahue, um, uh, has uh, uh, been dealing with a health issue. The concern is that she may have cancer. Uh, Vicki is... Uh, uh, a very a close niece, I understand, to Dick and Donna. So we want to remember Vicki Donahue as she's going through some further testing uh, in this uh, coming weeks. 
And on a celebratory note, uh, Doug Gintner and Robin, I understand, uh, are experiencing or having a 35th wedding anniversary today. Is that right? Uh, uh, congratulations, uh, uh, Robin. All right. Uh, well, let's join together in prayer as a congregation. Our Father God, once again, we gather uh, in gratitude to you. Uh, for so many of the graces and blessings you've bestowed on us this week. Father, for so many of the simple pleasures of life that we're often uh, guilty of taking for granted, for family life and love, uh, for the produce of our gardens and the health and pleasure it brings us, for meaningful work, and for times of rest and relaxation, we commit to praise you in gratitude as the giver of all these good blessings. Now this uh, congregation of believers we give you thanks for, and we ask that you will, as always, be present among us, uh, both as we conclude our time of worship today, and as we fellowship together, and then we ask you to carry us through the week ahead, as we go out to serve you in so many different ways and places. We especially want to thank uh, you for your hand of protection and guidance on Pastor Gary and Jane as they uh, traveled to Lynchburg this week and uh, the fact that you blessed them with a week of good friendship and mentoring and learning and service and brought them safely back home. Thank you for that blessing. And thank you once again for Pastor Gary and his leadership in our time of transition and for all of those who are working hard uh, in the CAT teamwork in the administration and children's ministries and other supportive work of this congregation, in the pastoral search committee. And we especially pray for the candidate and his wife uh, that we are working with. Uh, if indeed this candidate is within your will for us, may that process continue to un unfold in your gracious timing. And may we submit ourselves to whatever, whatever your will holds for us. We know, Lord, that that some of us have had difficult weeks and need a special measure of your grace and healing and our support. We remember Mike and Dorothy as he deals with health issues. We thank you for that Carl Bauman has gotten good news and ask you to bring full healing to him. And to Vicki Donahue, Dick's niece, um, we ask that uh, you will be especially with her, give her a special measure of grace and and strength as she deals with testing and the unknowns and, uh, and for the physicians and health professionals who are going to be working with her in the coming weeks. And knowing, as always, that there are those with us who carry burdens they cannot fully share, may they know our care and support and receive also your healing touch. Lord, we know that we are directed in your word to give generously and cheerfully as we are giving unto you and your work. And we do so today while asking that you will direct our offerings to get, to get today to further your kingdom of God work on earth. Lord, this summer day, our working weeks ahead, and our congregation, we place into your good care. May we faithfully live out your message this week. And we thank you for all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
just me to say one thing here. Uh, it's been a real uh, pleasure and privilege to have Steve with us the last two weeks here. And you want to talk about life getting hard? Uh, he, his church, um, see, tell me if I get the story right. His church, he meets in a group church, and the, the two groups were meeting together today, and one of the people in his group owns a Chick-fil-A down in Norristown. Is that right? Well, their church, those two groups are meeting today in Chick-fil-A. They are going to get Chick-fil-A sandwiches. Steve, you made the ultimate sacrifice to come and be with us today and not get a Chick-fil-A, but your family promised you that, uh, that they would bring them a sandwich home. So I just want to say thank you. I don't know if my 13 year old will, will allow the sandwich to get all the way home. That's right. <laughs> Might get half of it. But I just want to say thank you, Steve, for leading us. He will be with us in August again. And uh, we're just thankful for him, his willingness to be and share and giving up what he did today. I know nobody else is getting a Chick fil A sandwich on Sunday, that's for sure. <laughs> Gary taught us today from the words of Paul in Philippians, and I'd like to close uh, our service today as we go out for fellowship and for uh, six days of, of serving uh, God uh, with words also from the, uh, the Apostle Paul in Philippians 4, 7. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Go in peace.